Okay, great. So then just to recap, like I said before, let me just go back a step. So this is the advanced Pentaho training. We had the beginner and intermediate trainings um, a couple months ago. And we also have um, videos of the beginner and intermediate Pentaho training on the D2D portal as well. So today is the lecture session. So today in today's lecture, um, we'll recap some key items from the beginner intermediate Pentaho training. Um, then we'll get into um, how you can quote unquote pivot data with Pentaho. So that's both denormalizing the data and normalizing the data, depending on how you're pivoting it. And so Pentaho has a step called the row denormalizer and another step called the row normalizer. So when we're creating these transformations, um, you can create your transformations to either pivot data in one direction or pivot data in the other direction, thereby normalizing it or denormalizing it. So when, remember, when I say Pentaho, um, Pentaho is actually a suite. So Pentaho's full name is Pentaho Data Integration. And so there are four components um, of Pentaho. Right. One is Spoon, which is a desktop application. It's the GUI where you actually um, you have an interface in the editor to create transformations and jobs. So Spoon is the GUI that's actually used to build these ETLs, that is built, used to build the transformation and the jobs. So rather than having to write code like JavaScript or XML or whatever, um, Pentaho right, uses um, has a GUI called Spoon where you can actually drag and drop and create these transformations for the data migration. And then as you're creating those, as you're using the GUI and building your transformations, then on the back end, Pentaho automatically creates an XML file that has the code um, for these transformations and for these jobs. Then we have PAN. PAN is um, a standalone command line process that's used to execute transformations and jobs that are created um, in Spoon. So when we execute um, these transformations or these jobs from the command line, we're using PAN, right? When we actually build the ETLs themselves, we're using Spoon. Then we have Pentaho Kitchen. Um, Kitchen is another command line process, and it's used to um, Kitchen is used um, to schedule different Pentaho jobs via CRON, right? So with Spoon, you you develop the ETLs, so you develop the transformation and jobs files. With the Pan, Pan allows you to execute the transformations and execute the job files from the command line. Kitchen is a utility that lets you schedule these transformations and schedule these jobs to automatically run from the command line. And then you have Pentaho Cart, which D2D doesn't use. Cart is a lightweight web container, so it allows you to set up a dedicated remote ETL server. So that provides some similar functionality to the Pentaho um, data integration server but CART does not allow scheduling, security integration, content management. So CART just, again, it's a lightweight web container uh, they can use as a remote ETL server. Um, D2D doesn't use CART. D2D has its own Pentaho server. And D2D also executes um, the transformation of these jobs from the command line. So D2D uses Spoon, Pan, and Kitchen, um, but we don't use CART. But again, when I say, you know, when someone mentions Pentaho, um, you usually think of Spoon, which is the desktop application, the GUI for actually developing these ETL files. But there are other components to Pentaho as well. And this slide, this deck is in the training folder that I dropped into the chat. Um, I'll just go ahead and drop it one more time. And I'll probably update this deck further between today and the lab session on Thursday. Okay, so there's a few key items to remember 
um, in regards to Pentaho in the D2D environment. So the first thing that Penta uh, D2D uses Pentaho data integration version 8.2. There should be an eight, there should be a point, a dot here between um, the eight and the two. So I'll get that updated. But um, D2D uses Pentaho version 8.2 community edition. Um, so there's a community edition and an enterprise edition of Pentaho. Um, the community edition is open source, it doesn't come with a license. Um, the enterprise edition is licensed. You know, you have to pay money for it. It's pretty expensive. Um, the primary difference between the community edition and the enterprise edition um, is the enterprise comes with, with its own dedicated Pentaho server. And, you're, and it allows you to do scheduling directly from the Pentaho server. So D2D, like I said, has the community edition. Um, so that means that it doesn't have, um, it doesn't come with um, its own dedicated Pentaho server. Um, D2D has a Pentaho server that it created um, for the Pentaho environment. We also handle scheduling um, via the command line. So we use the, the kitchen utility to handle any scheduling from the command line. Um, with Pentaho Enterprise Edition, you have your own dedicated Pentaho server and Pentaho repository. You're, able, you're also able to do scheduling directly from the GUI as opposed to the command line. So in order to access Pentaho, um, you have to go through, you can, always, you can always download Pentaho locally, right, on your own um, computer. Um, but D2D um, has um, the Pentaho application within the DSVD environment, right? So if you have a DT, DSVD account, which I think you guys all should, if, you, if you're at the advanced Pentaho training, um, but you have a DSVD account, then once you're logged into DSVD staging or DSVD production environment, um, you'll be able to access Pentaho. So there's two ways to access the DSVD environment. Um, one way is through the Citrix. Um, one way is through, sorry, here we go. One way is through the Citrix um, desktop application. All right, so here I am in Citrix. There we go. So this is the DSVD environment, and this is in the Citrix desktop application, right? So once you access the DSVD environment, you have um, Pentaho and a bunch of other applications right, that we've covered in the beginner and intermediate training, right? So you can access the DSVD from um, the Citrix desktop application, or you can also ask, access DSVD from the web application, right? So for example, and D2D used to use Horizon for DSVD, um, but we since shifted to Citrix. So if the process looks slightly different to access DSVD, that's why we should be using Horizon, um, but now we're using Citrix, right? So this is the web, right? Citrix web. So right, you're entering your username or your ENT name, your password and your one-time um, password, um, and then secure off. And then you're able to choose right, DSVD production or DSVD staging, right? and this is from the web. Right, the other alternative is through the Citrix desktop application. So again, this is Citrix desktop, right? Same thing I see in web, just in the desktop um, format. And again, you can access production or staging. So like I said before, Spoon is the GUI of Pentaho, right? So this is what we're using to create and edit the transformations and jobs. Um, WinSCP is what we use to transfer files from your local PC or from one environment to the Pentaho server. Right, so ultimately, in order to execute these transformations and jobs from the command line, um, they need to be on the D2D Pentaho server. Um, so you can, you know, you can develop um, these files wherever you want. You can develop them in DSVD, you can develop them outside of DSVD. Um, but in order, right, to put them onto the D2D Pentaho server, um, to execute them from the command line, 
um, you have to be within DSCD and you have to use WinSCP in order to transfer those files from your local um, onto the DSVD Pentaho server. Um, then we have PuTTY, and these are all DSVD applications. Um, we then have PuTTY, which is um, the interface that we use for scripting. So whenever you, know, you want to access the command line and execute a shell script from the command line, um, you'll be using PuTTY in order to enter those commands. And then finally, um, D2D uses MySQL as its database tool. So we use MySQL to house our data warehouse. And so that's what we use for these trainings. We use MySQL um, because that's the database um, that D2D uses. It uses AWS or MySQL. It's a database system that it's using. Okay, um, so with that being said, right, the main topic for today is um, using Pentaho, right, to normalize or denormalize data, data, i.e. pivoting it. So um, when we think about normalization holistically, um, it's really two key areas that um, database normalization, normalization is used for. Um, one is to re reduce the redundancy um, in the database. And then the other is to improve data integrity, right? So here's an example, right, of a basic diagram of schemas, right, relationships, and a normalized database, right? So we have one table containing um, data about the albums, right? So in this case, it looks like this is like a musical database, right? We have three tables, albums, genres, and artists, right? So one table has um, it has album information about the album, right? So the album ID, the album name, when it was released, and then it has an artist ID and the genre ID as well, right? Then we have these other relational tables, right, that have a relationship to this primary table right here. So we have um, the genre table, right, that has the genre ID and the actual genre. Then we have a table containing just information about the artist, right, the artist name, and then the unique ID for each artist, right? So here's an example of a database that's using normalization, right? It's using, um, it has multiple tables that have a relationship between one another, um, and each table has unique information, right? This table has information about the album, this table has information about the, um, the genre for that album, and this table has information about the artist for the album. Right, so it's not one large table containing everything. Um, it's several compact tables that have a relationship to one another, right? And so that's the main key of normalization. Again, it's two things. One, to reduce redundancy in a table, right? So if you had these all in one table, then you would have, you know, multiple artists because, you know, one artist can have several different albums. Um, and one artist can have albums that, all of, that have um, of different genres, right? They could have a rock album, they could have a folk album, they could have a country album, right? Um, so instead of having one large table with duplicated data, right, you have various tables with unique information that have a relationship to one another and they can be joined to retrieve that information if need be. Right, and so there are benefits to that, right? You can see that these have indices, so you can index data, meaning that when you hit the tables, when you query the tables, return data faster, right? It generally keeps a cleaner, quote unquote, cleaner database structure, because like I said, there are less duplicates and you know where to go if you're looking for specific information. And again, each table still has a relationship to one another as well. Um, with that being said, there are still instances where you might want to denormalize data or when you might just want to denormalize database, right, as a force of database that has normalization. So these are some examples, right? So one example is, you know, if you're constantly joining data to or joining various tables to return a data set, and every time you're accessing this database, you're really just looking for a full set of data. 
it might make sense to denormalize the data in that situation. Another case is when you're doing reporting. You know, let's say for your, you know, you have, let's say, for example, a Tableau dashboard and, you know, you, you're, that Tableau dashboard is being sourced from the database and you have a lot of heavy joins and complex joins that are being used in order to create this data set that the dashboard is using, right? That's going to impact performance to load the data, right? If they're doing these table scans across uh, multiple joins and they're complex joins. So it's really at a holistic level. And like holistically, there are pros to cons, pros and cons of having to normalize or denormalize database. Um, and it's really up to, you know, one, the data that you have in the database, two, how the data is being used for reporting. And then three, the type of queries that you're running, right, to retrieve data. And this is really at a holistic level. But in terms of what we're looking at today, we're not looking at a holistic level of normalization in the database. Um, what we're looking at is really, if we have a data set that has normalized or denormalized data, um, how can we pivot that data? Or how can we, you know, if it's denormalized, how can we normalize it? If it's normalized, how can we denormalize it? If there's certain things that we're looking at in that data set. So here's an example of a transformation that's taking normalized data and, and it's denormalizing it. Right, so the first thing we're doing in the transformation stream is first we're reading, we have a, you know, a CSV file where our data is being stored. So we're first just reading that CSV file and pulling data from the CSV. Then we're sorting, we're grouping and sorting the data on a, based on a couple of fields. We're then denormalizing the data in this step. We're sorting the data again. And then we're writing the data into an Excel file. So the, in the first step in the stream, right? So the first step in the transformation stream is a CSV file input. So here's the data within the CSV file that we're referencing in this step. So here we have a list of movies, and these are some of my favorite movies that I've watched. I highly recommend them if you haven't seen any of these, but all pretty good movies. Um, some are a little bit older, some are more recent, but um, they're all pretty good all the same. Um, so we have a list of movies, right? The year that the movie was released. And then we have um, the quarter of that year, right? The quarter of that fiscal year, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and how much the movie grossed in that fiscal year. So this is just dummy data. I don't actually know how much money um, these movies grossed. Um, I don't think any of them grossed that much money, honestly. Um, I mean, Do the Right Thing was pretty popular, and so was No Country for Old Men. Um, Anyway, that being said, uh, this is dummy data. It's not actually reflective of how much money these movies gross, but this is what the data set contains, right? The movie title, um, the year that the movie was released, um, the fiscal, um, the quarter of each fiscal year, and how much that movie grossed in this fiscal year quarter. Right, so the first thing we did in the CSV file input step is I selected the file that I wanted, right? So I selected the CSV file that had this information. And then I pulled all the fields in the CSV file, right? So again, there's four fields, movie, year, quarter, and growth. And those are the four fields that, I, that I'm pulling, right? So I'm pulling every field from this data set, this CSV file. And then Pentaho is then, once I pull those movies, Pentaho is automatically then determining the type, you know, whether it's a string, whether it's an integer, determining the length and the other, um, other fields here as well, right? So if any of this is incorrect, if let's say, you know, I, I click on get fields, um, Pentaho pulls the fields from the CSV file and um, movie is a string, right? But Pentaho thinks it's an integer for whatever reason. 
I have the ability, right, to update and change that from, from um, integer to string, right, if the type is incorrect. So in this case, Pentaho recognized all these fields correctly and assigned the correct type. So I didn't need to make any changes to the step here other than, right, creating the step, um, selecting the file name, or selecting the file, and then just pulling all the fields by clicking on the get fields um, button right here. So the next step that we have here is um, the sort rows step, right? So first we have the CSV file we're sourcing the data from, and we're just, you know, we're first referencing that CSV file, and then we're selecting all the fields that we want to source data from. And this sort row step, we're doing two things, right? Um, the first thing that we're doing is we're choosing the fields that we want to sort on, so in this case, movie and year. Um, and then we're choosing the order that we want to sort on, right? So first we're choosing which fields do we want to group this data by. So I want to group this data by movie and year, right? So looking at the data, um, regardless of what quarter it's in or regardless of you know, how much it grossed, it should still be attached to the movie, the same movie in the same year, right? So you can see, do the right thing that has um, two entries in this table, right? So do the right thing in 1989, 1989, right? So in quarter two, it grows 75,000. In quarter four, it grows 95,000. So regardless of how I'm sorting this data, I want it to be grouped by the movie and the year. So first we're grouping by movie and year. And then we're choosing to sort first by movie and then by year. Although at this point, the sorting doesn't, isn't really critical at this point. So again, I can get fields. It's gonna pull all fields from the CSV file, um, but I'm gonna delete right, any fields that I don't wanna group on. Right? So I only wanna group on movie and year. So once I get the fields, I'm gonna remove the fields that I don't wanna group on. or group by, I should say. Okay, then we have the road normalizer step itself, right? So there's a few um, different things going on here. Um, the first thing is I want to define a quote unquote key field, right? So this is the field from the source table. Um, that's going to be that's going to be responsible for the denormalization. So we're denormalizing based on this field. Right, so you can see in the quarter, I have um, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. Right, so right now, this is a denormalized table, right? So we have the movie, we have the year, we have the quarter, right? And we have you know, the different types, you know, the different types of quarter, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, within one quarter field or one quarter column, then we have the gross, right? So in the denormalizer step, this is where the data is quote unquote being pivoted, right? So right now we have one quarter field that has again, different quarter values, right? Q1, Q2, Q3, Q3 and Q4. So, that's the field that we're going to key on, the quarter field, because this is the field that we quote unquote want to denormalize, that we want to pivot. Instead of having um, one field for quarter, I want to have multiple fields for each quarter, right? I want to have a field for quarter one, a field for quarter two, a field for quarter three, and a field for quarter four. So that's why I chose quarter here in this key field. Then here again, I'm choosing which fields to group by, right? So again, regardless of what quarter it is and um, what the gross is, I still want it to be, to be grouped by movie and year, right? Because I still have a relationship to the movie and to the year that that movie was released. Then in the target fields here, I'm now, creating four new target fields, right? Because again, if I look at the source table, 
I have um, one field for quarter with the different quarter values, right? Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4. So what I'm doing now is I'm taking this source, right? This source of quarter. And from that source, I'm deriving four different fields, right? So I entered in quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four. And so where am I getting, um, where am I getting the values for these fields, right? So I'm creating a field quarter one, a new field quarter two, a new field quarter three, and a new field quarter four. But where am I populating, right? How are these fields be populated? Well, they're gonna be populated um, with the gross amounts, right? So for each quarter, um, each quarter field will be populated with data of the gross amount, and it will be corresponding to um, which quarter it grossed in, right? So for example, you can see for Q1 here has a gross of 50,000, right? This Q1 and 50,000 is attached to this movie in this year because we're, again, we're grouping by movie and year. Right, so each quarter in gross is attached to a movie and a year. Right, so I have for um, a separation that was released in 2001. This is Q1, the quarter is Q1, and the gross is 50,000. So when I denormalize this data and pivot the data, then I will now have a field called quarter one. And for this movie, a separation, its quarter one value will be 50,000, right? Because Q1 is now becoming quarter one and it holds a gross value of 50,000. For this movie, The Master, it's gonna be the same thing, right? So this is in Q1. So now in the quarter one field, instead of having a quarter field with a Q1 type or Q1 value, I now have a quarter one field that has a gross of 100,000 for the master released in 2012. All right, so what we're doing here is quote unquote pivoting the data. And then the next thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna resort the data so that when it writes into the Excel file, it's gonna sort it first by year and then by movie. And then the final step is this Microsoft Excel writer, right? So the final step is one we're choosing the file where it should be written into and the location. We're using the Excel extension, so it's really just whether you're using Excel, we're using Excel 2000 and above or prior to Excel 2000. And then we're also entering the name of the sheet that we want. We're entering, um, given a value for what we want to name the sheet that it's being written into, right? And so there's a bunch of other things you can do as well. Right? You can include the date in the file name, include time in the file name, and specify a date format, but at a minimum, right, we're just, again, selecting the file that we want to write into, choosing which version of Excel we're using, and then naming the sheet within the Excel file. So then once I, when I execute the transformation, so in the beginning of the intermediate training, Usually when we executed in the ETL, we executed it from the command line, right? So we first created the transformation, we then created a job which would call the transformation, and then it would also send an email if it was completed successfully, or a failure email if um, there's an issue um, executing that transformation, right? So usually we create a transformation, we'll create a job containing the transformation and containing a step to send us a success email or a failure email, um, and then we'd execute, and um, we create a shell script, right, that we could execute from the command line. Um, but in this case here, um, because this is just, you know, in this case, 
Um, like I said, you know, normalization and denormalization, like holistically, we usually talk in, uh, in terms of how we want to structure a database. Um, usually a database will be structured using normalization or denormalization, right? It's kind of um, depending on the data that you have, the type of reporting you're doing, it's a holistic decision that you're doing. You're usually not going to have half of your tables are normalized and half of your tables are denormalized um, because that kind of defeats the purpose, right? Um, so in terms of what we're doing, right, in Pentaho, we're doing this at a more granular level. So really we're using this in a situation where we have normalized data, um, but we want to pivot that data because we want to look at it in a different way or present it in a different way. And so in this case, we're not executing this shell script from the command line. Um, this was actually just executed in Pentaho itself, right? So in Spoon, you have the ability to execute your transformation. And usually it's, it's faster to execute it from the command line, especially depending on what database connections that you have. But in this case, right, we're just, we're sourcing it from a CSV file and we're writing it into an Excel file, right? So we're not going across different databases, different networks. This is all internal. This is all local. So in this case, this is just executed, right, locally um, within Spoon, just executing the transformation itself. So this is the data that we sourced. So this CSV file input, right? This is the data, um, how it was structured when it was sourced. And once we complete this transformation, this is how the data is now um, structured, right? So this is a normalized table and it's now denormalized, i.e. it's been pivoted. Right, so now we can see the movie and the year, and then we can see, right, we can more easily compare, right, for each movie, right, what are gross in quarter one, what are gross in quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four, right? So depending on how you're using this data, um, there might be a situation, right, when you need to pivot that data because of how you're trying to present it in a dashboard or how you're trying to present it, you know, or, you, or if you just want to drill down to the data, but it's easier to denormalize, denormalize it. This is a use case, right? Where at a more granular level, you might want to denormalize the data. So just like we denormalize the data, you can do the same thing the other direction. So you can also normalize data, right? You can have a denormalized data set to then normalizing and pivoting to present in a normalized fashion, right? So you could have um, somebody who, you know, let's say that, um, you know, you have a manual data source, right? So data that's not coming from a database, but manual data that's been, uh, or data that's been manually gathered, right? And so you have this data in a Google Sheet that's someone manually gathered. Um, you decide that you want to import this data into a database um, because you, you have a Tableau dashboard that's, say, that's sourcing data um, from a database. And so you want to manually add, right, you want to import this manual data into the database so that you can leverage it in your Tableau dashboard. And let's say that this database that you're using is a normalized database. And so you can't just throw in the data in the state it is into this database. It first needs to be normalized before being imported into the database. Right, so it's the same thing as the denormalization stream, but um, in the opposite direction, right? So you have this with a few less steps, right? So you have the source of where you're reading the data from. So in my examples, I'm reading, I'm sourcing data from a CSV, but this data could be sourced from, you know, it could be sourced from a database, it can be sourced from an S3 bucket, it can be sourced from whatever source Pentaho allows and where the data is being stored, right? And that's what Pentaho is used for. It's used for migrating data from one source to another source, whether that's in the cloud, whether that's S3, whether that's in a database, whether that's in a flat file, right? 
Pentel can, can handle a lot of different data sources. So first, we're sourcing the data from the location, or in which in this case, a CSV file. Then we're normalizing it, i.e. pivoting it. And then we're writing into a database table in this example, right? So in the denormalization example, we're taking a CSV file and then writing it into um, a separate Excel file. In this case, we're taking a CSV file and we're writing it into a MySQL database table. Okay, so the first step, right, like we saw in the denormalization stream, um, the first step is again a CSV file input step because that's where we're sourcing the data, um, the data from, right? In this case, we're sourcing it from a CSV file. But like I said, um, this data could be stored anywhere, right? It could be in a database, it could be um, in an S3 bucket. So again, Pentel can, can handle data coming from different locations or different sources, I should say. Right, and so here is a denormalized table. Right, so we have the movie title. Again, we have the year, and then we have um, the quarter that it's in. Right, so the first thing we're doing is we're just pulling the fields right, that we want to source data from, which again, is just everything in this, in this uh, CSV file. So just pulling the fields from the CSV file, Pentaho is automatically determining what the data type is and some other information. If it's not correct, um, you can always um, re manually revise it or modify it. In this case, it is correct, right? The title is a string, and then everything else is an integer. Then we have the actual row normalizer step where the data is being pivoted. Right, so again, we're choosing um, the key field, or we're choosing the field that's the key, this normalization, that's the key to pivoting data. Right, so we have quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four. So in this case, we're entering the name of the new field that we're gonna pivot the data into, right? So this type field, right now we don't have a field called quarter, but what, what we wanna do when we pivot this data is we wanna take all this quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four. Instead of having them in the individual fields, we wanna pivot them into one field, right? And so that's the field that I entered here that doesn't yet exist, um, but we're gonna create, right? So quarter. Then we have the field names that we're sourcing um, data from, right? So quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four, right? And that's what we see in this data set here, right? Quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four. And each of these fields has, right, has data within it, right? In quarter one, right, we have values for a separation of country for women and the master. In quarter four, we have um, values for raging bull, do the right thing, et cetera, right? So first thing I'm doing is I'm pivoting quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four into a singular field um, called quarter. And I'm assigning a value for each of those fields, right? So quarter one will not be the Q, will not have a Q1 value in the quarter field. Quarter two will now have a Q2 value in the quarter field. Quarter three will now have a Q3 value in the quarter field. And quarter four will now have a Q4 value in the quarter field, right? So all of these are that have it, their own individual columns, right? They're now all gonna go into one column, right? Q1, Q, so they're all go, going to go into one column called quarter. And we'll have a Q1 value, a Q2 value, a Q3 value, and a Q4 value in that quarter column. Um, now, all of these 
um, values, right? 60,000, 75,000, right? Whatever the gross was for that quarter. We're now gonna create a new field, right? Called gross, right? So now we're creating two new fields. One, we're creating a new field called quarter. This is how we're pivoting the data, right? So we're pivoting the data, all these different quarters, quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four, are being pivoted into this new field called a quarter, and they're given a value of Q1, Q2, Q2, Q3, and Q4, right? Then depending on the value, um, it's being entered into a new field called gross, right? So when we pivot Apocalypse Now into the quarter field of Q1, it's not gonna have a gross value of 60,000. So we're doing two things or three things I should say here. Um, one, we're pivoting, right, based on the key value that we define, which in this case is quarter. Two, we're then given a value for each quarter field, right? And then three, we're now given a value for each gross that used to exist within each quarter field. We're not creating a new field called gross to contain those values. And then the final step in the stream is, right, we're choosing a MySQL table to write into, right? So step one was to source um, this data from the CSV file. Step two was to normalize, i.e. pivot the data. And step three is that we're then configuring this table output step with a correct table to write into, right? So we're choosing the database connection, right? Whether it's a MySQL database, an Oracle database, we need to enter in by the connection details, right? The host name, the server report, the username being used, the password, right? The credentials for the database and the database connection uh, details itself. We're choosing um, the table that we want to write into in the database. So in this case, we have a table in this, in this database called movies. We're then doing a truncate and load. So as we covered in beginner intermediate, the different ways to write data into the tables, you can do a truncate and load, you can do an insert and update, you can do an insert. Um, so there's various ways to write data, right? In this case, we're doing a truncate and load. And then I'm choosing the database fields, I'm specifying the database fields to write into, right? Because in this case, um, this movie field, or sorry, this movies table actually has five fields, it has ID, title, year, quarter, and growth. So it has the four fields listed here, but it has an additional um, field called ID, right? So ID is an auto increment field. So it's gonna automatically increment based on what values are written into or how many records are written into that table. So in that case, I don't need to worry about the ID field, especially since that wasn't covered in this stream, right? So we have title, year, quarter, growth, all of these fields are coming from one of two places, right? They're coming from the stream. So when I say this stream, I mean the stream of steps that I have here, right? And these fields, that I'm, these database fields I'm specifying are all coming from this stream, right? So they're either coming from the CSV file itself, like, like title and year are coming from the CSV file itself, or they're coming from the row normalizer step, right? Where I create a field called quarter to pivot on, and I create a field called gross, right? To populate values into, right? So when I'm specifying these database fields, right, it's pulling these fields that are coming from these streams. And so that's where, um, well, two, I should say, is actually two sources, right? So when I click on specify database fields, um, one, when I click on get fields, it's pulling all of the fields from this database table, right? This movie's database table. When I click on get fields, that's where it's pulling this from, it's using this database connection to pull the fields that are currently existing in this movie's table. But then also these stream fields, uh, the table field is the target, right? This is referring to the target table. So right in this movies table, right, I have a title, year, quarter, and gross field. And then 
So these are the target fields that's being written into. But the stream fields, right, this is where the data is being sourced from, right? And so title and year are coming from the CSV file. Quarter, quarter and growth, right, are coming from row norm, the row normalizer step, right? When we pivot all these different quarters into, the, into one quarter field, and then we then create a growth field containing the quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, and quarter four values. So then here's the result when I normalize the data, right? So when I normalize the data, i.e. pivot it, Right here on the left side is the denormalized data. So this is the data from the CSV file, right? That's denormalized. Right, so I have the CSV file, I have the row normalizer step, and then I have a table output step that writes into the MySQL table. Right, so here's that CSV file input step, right? Here's the data in the CSV file. And then here's the output table step, right? When I write it into the MySQL table. Right, so here's the title, right, here's the year, here's the quarter, and here's the gross, right? So it's taking this denormalized data, and now it's pivoting it and normalizing it. Right, so you can go in either direction, right? So you can normalize the data like we saw, or you can denormalize the data, excuse me, like we saw here. Right, in this case, again, where we had a normalized data in a CSV file, and then we exported it into an uh, Excel file. Right, so you can normalize the data like we saw here, or de excuse me, you can denormalize the data like we saw here, or alternatively, you can pivot the data in the other direction. Whoops. You can pivot the data in the other direction and you can normalize it like we're seeing here, right? So this can be between um, CSV files, Excel files, database tables, right? The data source doesn't really matter. I mean, obviously there's some um, things that are taken into consideration, um, you know, when you're sourcing data, or writing data into databases, um, but you know, it can be from a denormalized database and you're writing it into a normalized database. It can be from a CSV file. It can be from an Excel file, right? It doesn't matter where the data is sourced. Um, you're able to choose, you know, one data source and write it into another data source um, and normalize or denormalizing it, right, with these steps along the way. Right, so these are pretty straightforward examples. Um, obviously, your data might be more complex than this. But these are basic examples, right? How data can be pivoted um, using Pentaho, right? If you need to pivot this data, you know, one, to use for reporting, two, if it just helps you yourself drill down more easily, right? If the data is pivoted in another direction. So are there any questions about what we went over? Okay, I will take that as a no. So this was a lecture session, ended about 30 minutes early. Um, well, this was a lecture session, right? We just walked through kind of the concept and then I, you know, kind of walked through um, how to do it in Pentaho in the um, in the lab exercise of the lab on Thursday. And then we'll actually get into Pentaho. Um, we'll then create you know we'll create these transformations from scratch. We'll create the job file and then we'll execute it from the command line. So so the lecture is kind of just going over the concept and the lab on Thursday. We'll be actually you know creating the ETL file itself and then executing it from the command line.
Okay, well, that being said, if there are no other questions, um, I will speak to you all again on Thursday. Thank you, Mike.